And uh, you made it, making it here. We'll say today's 90% of success. How about that? Some days it's 80. Today, I think it's 90. If you're joining us online, thank you for doing that as well. Today, we're going to continue our series. I think it's week eight, maybe week seven. I don't know. I've kind of lost track um, of um, our series on loving intentionally, where we are talking about the application of love that was made by the Apostle Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to a brand new church at Corinth. Last week, we talked about Corinth. We talked about the 10 issues the church at Corinth was facing. We talked about why the Apostle Paul wrote this book and um, kind of gave you some insight and perspective into what was happening in this church, brand new believers in a, in a world that was really set up against following Christ. And today we're gonna continue and we're gonna pick one more theme or one more phrase from 1 Corinthians 13. And today we're gonna to be talking about not being easily angered. Hope you're ready for that uh, because we are angry people. Um, you may not feel particularly angry this morning, but um, you don't have to exist very many days in the world we live in to realize that we live in a world that is just right at the boiling point that we are oftentimes angry people looking for an excuse to let our anger spill out on the people closest to us or maybe even people who we happen to meet by chance throughout our day. First Corinthians 13, you ready to read it again? One more time. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. That's where we'll be today, which is why it's underlined and in bold. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. And love never what? Fails. I fail. You fail. We fail. Love never fails. Agape love, the love that comes from commitment, not a love based on circumstance or emotion, feeling what somebody or something does for me, but what I can do for them. More importantly, what I can do for God. I'm in it for as long as it takes, no matter what it takes, because Jesus loved me. And so the apostle Paul is applying love to a church, a brand new church of people who have come from a really difficult background, most of them, trying to figure out how they can live in community. And I love that because it applies to all of us. And the world they live in is a lot like the world we live in, even though there's some differences. Some of the similarities are eerie. So as we dive into this, let's talk about this word anger that's used here in 1 Corinthians 13, because there are two different words for anger that we're gonna look at today, and they're important to understand. In English, they're both translated anger, but in the original language, there's two different words, and the second word that we're gonna address is used far more often than this word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians. The word that Paul uses when he says love does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, is a word for anger that literally just means allowing yourself to be provoked. Maybe you have a translation of the Bible that says that, not easily provoked. Um, somebody who uh, is not irritated easily. Uh-oh. Uh um, let's stop here for just a second. I need somebody to testify. Uh, anybody irritated? I won't ask you to say anything, but anybody irritated easily? Anyone? Um, some of you are liars. It's okay. That's in there too. That's in there. There's got to be one in there. Love does not lie. I mean, ir I I get irritated so easy. Um, you know, I, I have an excuse and maybe you have an excuse too. I mean, we have all kinds of excuses. We have excuses about my blood sugar is too high. My blood sugar is too low. Too much testosterone, not enough testosterone. Menopause, menopause. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we go through. Um, I had pizza last night, so I'm angry. I didn't have enough food, so I'm cranky. Too much kids, haven't seen the kids enough, right? Too much wife, haven't seen the wife enough. All kinds of things can make us angry. So for me, after I had, um, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer a few years ago, one of the treatments that my doctors do is they have me on levothyroxine at a level that keeps me in a hyperthyroid state that's considered dangerous for people that don't have cancer. And so one of the byproducts or side effects of this is, is that I run on that jittery, angry, irritated, uh, irritable line all the time. And so I can say, 
these don't apply to me. The law doesn't apply to me. The Bible doesn't apply to me. The apostle Paul doesn't apply to me. I have a reason for being angry. So look out and I can ruin my marriage. I can make my kids not want to talk to me. I can make my staff hate my guts. I mean, you guys would not trust me. How many times have you heard an angry pastor preach? That's not fun at all, right? All of us have reasons or genetic predispositions or life circumstances that give us explanations for why we might run right there on the irritable side. But none of them are excuses. Because at the end of the day, love is not easily angered. And so regardless of what we're dealing with, we deal with it because there's things that are more important than, than that. So don't be so prickly. Don't be like living with a porcupine. Don't make the people close to you walk on eggshells because they're worried you're going to erupt at a moment's notice over nothing. And Paul says, love doesn't do that. But you and I do that. I talked to a good friend after first service and he said, I drive angry. Now he wasn't saying I do. He was saying he does. He said, I drive angry. And I said, well, I kind of do as well. And he said, it doesn't even matter. Somebody doesn't even have to provoke me. He said, I just get behind the wheel and back out of my garage. And when I grab the steering wheel, he said, I just get angry. He said, I'm going to war. And I'm like, I get it. I understand. We're men. We're created that way, right? We're going out to hunt and to gather. We have both hands on the wheel. Get in my way. Um, no, right? We can't even drive angry because love is not easily provoked, easily irritated, does not explode. Love chills out. Love expects the best. Love gives the benefit of the doubt. My wife, my wife did not wake up this morning and look at her phone and the first thing on her to-do list was not make Rick's life miserable before breakfast. She did not have that on her to-do list and yours probably doesn't either. Assume that the people around you are well-intended and they live in a different, difficult world, just like we do. And that things happen. And we have to have softer hearts and slower reactions and a gentler spirit. But you and I, we fall into a trap because we're Christians, most of us, and we know how to use the Bible to our advantage and how to use the Bible to justify things that we wanna do. And so what we say is, well, my anger is righteous anger. You ever heard anybody say that? My anger is righteous anger. Yours isn't righteous anger. Yours is unrighteous, but mine's righteous so I can do whatever I want. And righteous anger is not being angry because you think you're right. Now, that's what a lot of Christians have uh, taken that to mean. Righteous anger does not really have much to do at all with how you feel or think about yourself. It has to do with how you feel or think about other people and particularly the way that God feels and thinks about other people. If you find yourself being angry at the things that God cares deeply about and that are attacking the things that God cares about, then that's okay to be angry. But even when we're angry, we can't sin. But that's a different kind of anger that the apostle Paul is talking about. The Bible tells us many instructions, you know, whoever is patient has great understanding, uh, but one who is quick tempered displays folly, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those whose hope in the Lord will inherit the land. And I think about this whole righteous anger kind of a concept. And I think about Christians over the years who've done unspeakable things in the name of God because they thought they were right. There were wars, there were crusades, there were murders, there were genocides, government overthrows, and on and on and on. And at the root of many of these things, was a spiritual leader who said, God wants us to do this. He's mad at them, so we're mad at them, so we can do whatever we want. And we know because we study the Bible and we submit to the word of God that we don't fight God's battles with the devil's means, that we don't fight like the world to try to stand for the things of the Lord. And righteous anger is not a loophole for your and my bad behavior. And it's certainly not an excuse for us treating other people 
in unspeakable ways. Matthew chapter five talks about this and you'll have homework this week. You'll have devotions that are sent right to your phone. If you have the church app downloaded at seven o'clock every morning, you'll have a devotional that I've written for you on anger. And if you want at the end of the service, you'll be able to download this with a QR code. You can go to any of our social media platforms and you can get this or our website. But on Monday, we're going to talk about what the big, what's the big deal about anger. On Tuesday, we're going to talk about righteous anger, what it is and what it isn't. On Wednesday, we're going to turn the corner and we're going to talk a little bit about the anger that we kind of have inside that's under the surface that nobody really sees, but they feel on Thursday, five ways that we express anger and things to watch out for. And then on Friday is the day where we take responsibility for the people in our life we've hurt and we say we're sorry and we tell them how specifically we're not going to do it anymore. So this is going to be a week where we work on it. And Matthew 5 is going to be one of the passages that you're going to be dealing with. But I want to walk you through this very quickly because it's important. It reinforces the significance of anger. Now, the word is changing here from a response of irritability, of explosion, of being prickly to a deep-seated heartfelt condition that becomes part of our character. Now, in the second half of my teaching time, I'm going to explain that to you. But Jesus is teaching in Matthew 5, and this is um, an illustration of how seriously he takes this, this issue. He says, you've heard that it's said by people or to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And everybody listening would say, yeah, don't murder. Murder's bad. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Now, judgment here doesn't mean final judgment. This means judgment in the civil court and the penalty was the death penalty. And that's what Jesus was talking about. So you can be a murderer, shouldn't be. But if you have murdered, you still can confess your sin and be forgiven for your sin. And you still can go to heaven. That's not what this passage is saying. Don't murder. That's not what this passage is saying either, but that's not an unpardonable sin. You shall not murder. And anybody who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And there's a little bit of a change in the play on words here. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in the danger or in danger of the fires of hell. Now there's kind of a progression here. And the reason Jesus was teaching this is the Pharisees said, well, I don't kill people. So it doesn't matter how I treat people. Well, I don't kill my wife, so it doesn't matter how angry I am at my wife. Well, I've never murdered my kids, so it doesn't really matter how I yell at my kids. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You have to understand what you do is important. It can send you to jail. But how you are inside is just as important. And he says, anyone who says raka to somebody, now raka is an intranslatable or untranslatable word. And it literally is a word of just detesting somebody, dismissing somebody. It's like erasing somebody from existence. You don't matter to me. I hate you. Basically go to you know where. And, and that's in a sense all encapsulated in this word. And for us to look at somebody and say, you no longer matter to me as a person because of what you stand for, where you came from, what you've done to me, and you dismiss them with the, the worst sort of an insult label that you could possibly come up with. And I can't give you many parallels without saying words that aren't church appropriate, but you get what I mean. And God says, look out. Again, Anyone who says you fool could even be in the danger of the fires of hell. That if we have an attitude toward other people where we find their opinions worthless and their existence insignificant, where we have our hearts set against them as a group or as an individual, and are willing to pronounce this judgment by calling a name or assigning a label, then there's a good indication that maybe our heart has never been redeemed by the Lord and the Holy Spirit doesn't live there in the first place. That if anger goes unchecked in the heart of a person and spills out into behavior where we're dismissing, insulting, dividing, destroying, Jesus may never have saved us in the first place. We never understood grace. And then Jesus goes on to say, therefore, if you're on your way to church, 
if you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. And he's talking here in the context of anger that you have either made somebody angry by your actions or you have, have displayed anger and there's an infraction, a broken relationship. And Romans tells us that we're supposed to do everything possible to be at peace. That there's some things we can't, I mean, they're just, the, the, the damage has been done. Too much has gone on. But most things we can remedy or at least make an effort. If we're on our way to church and we remember that, that our brother or sister has something against us, that our anger has divided our marriage, our family, our friendships, or our church, your workplace, Stop what you're doing. Leave your gift there in front of the altar, which the picture here, the original hearers, would have visualized taking their offering to the temple to give it to the priest. And then they remember that they have to go do something because their anger has caused an infraction with another person. And because that infraction was caused with another person, God took it personally and said, until you go make that right or do your best to make it right, I don't want your offering. You set it down at the altar because you intend to come back and you go and make it right and do what you can. And then you come back to church and then you worship. That God takes it that seriously that our one another's affect this relationship so much that this relationship can never be right. If we are consumed with anger, that oftentimes, well, it's kind of a gateway sort of a drug, this type of anger that the apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. If we find ourselves allowing ourselves to explode unchecked, to be prickly, to take every offense, to cause arguments, to fight with everybody, eventually it becomes a character trait. It becomes an issue. It becomes part of our identity. And we become angry, sullen, dangerous people who break things like relationships. And if unchecked, anger can destroy. So we check it. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the second half of our time together. How we check it, how we correct it, and how we live a different way. So it occurs to me that this whole subject of anger is pretty confusing. In some cases, um, our anger and the emotions we feel and the reasons for it and whether it's righteous or not righteous, it all just kind of seems like a jumbled knot. And um, Matthew 5, as we discussed just a minute ago, it talks about when you're on your way to worship and you're offering your gift. I was thinking about the gift that I want you to offer the Lord today. And the gift that I want you to offer God today is your anger your confusion, your reasons, the misunderstandings. A lot of anger is caused by frustration. Life is not the way that you want it to be. It's not the way that you think it should be. Things have not turned out the way they ought to have turned out. From disappointment with God, with other people. And I want you today to offer it to the Lord and say, this is a burden I can't carry, but it's there and it's destroying my relationships. It's dividing, it's discrediting and it's disgusting. And I wanna pray for you right now as we spend a few more minutes talking about this, that this will be a day for you to heal. Father, as we consider giving you our anger, our frustration, our disappointment, our confusion about what's right, what's not right, the jumbled emotions that we have, all the history with people and circumstances, we offer it to you, we give it to you because you're God and we're not and we can't figure it out. So we cast the burden on you, it's yours. Teach us what to do with it, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So the Apostle Paul goes on to talk about what we do with anger, and it's sort of a, a parallel thought to Matthew chapter 5. You may have heard this before. He says that when we're angry, we need to be very careful not to let the sun go down while we're still angry, because if we do, we'll give the devil a foothold. And this is often misunderstood. Now, this is the second use or the second word that's used much more commonly in the New Testament for anger. And this is sort of what happens if you don't, uh, or you're not careful about that first thing Paul was talking about with the constant explosions, the irritability, the, the friction with people. It becomes part of your character. It becomes part of your perspective. And it's sort of a way that you begin to view the world. This anger is not a momentary expression, but a deep-seated, determined conviction. Like you're putting on a pair of sunglasses with a colored lens, and everything in the world you see is tainted and mischaracterized by your anger. And the Apostle Paul says, in your anger, don't sin, which means it is possible to be angry and not sin. But most of the time, our anger is sinful. And in almost every other incidence that the Apostle Paul writes about it, he tells us to get rid of it, to put it in the rearview mirror, to run from it, that it's disgusting, it's detestable, we got to give it to the Lord, we got to get away because anger destroys. And so he says, in your anger, don't sin. And he says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that someone says, now, if you've let the sun go down while you're angry, something bad is going to happen to you. And, and, and it's really misunderstood because the kind of anger that the Apostle Paul is talking about is the deep-seated anger that's become part of your character. And it's far beyond you and your wife laying there in bed, having a little squabble over dinner, and then staying awake till three o'clock in the morning, trying to iron out your differences. That's important to do. But that's not at all what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he's writing this important instruction. It's very important to keep a current account of wrongs, to be able to work out the things with your spouse or with your kids to where they don't fester, where they don't become worse, where it doesn't become part of your character and you become unsafe. But the Apostle Paul is almost certainly referring to Psalm 4.4, where he's talking about laying in bed and examining your heart. Because if anger, and it's this deep-seated part of your character where you view the world with a chip on your shoulder and with suspicion, with contempt or hatred, groups of people, people, systems, whatever it would be. And he says, if you leave it in your life unchecked for a period of time, which is why he says, don't let the sun go down while you're angry for days and days and days, that it becomes part of who you are and you can't separate it from the way you think. And what happens is that it gives the devil a foothold. And foothold is an interesting word. You may think foothold means what I used to think it meant, which is like if you're climbing a hill and it's slippery and you need a place to put your foot, right? There's a little foothold, but it's not. It literally means a room or a space. And so what the Apostle Paul is saying here is in your anger, don't sin. And if you have sinful anger that's lurking, that's part of who you are, it's festering and it's causing damage, don't let time go by because Satan will set up an office in your heart. And we know in 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul says that we are subject to the schemes and tricks of the devil. And these are three things that I think that Satan wants to do to us. And I believe he uses our anger to do it. The first one is, I think that Satan uses our anger to divide. He divides families, he divides friendships, and he divides churches. And oftentimes the divides start from something so petty and insignificant that when time goes by, you don't even remember what caused it in the first place. But an offense is made, offense is taken, lines are drawn, Division occurs and Satan wins. And there's an underlying brooding tension about the family, the former friend group, or even the church where you just know something's wrong. An outsider can't put their finger on it, but when you check the pulse, it's not healthy. And that's the first thing I believe Satan wants to do. And he uses our chippiness, our inability or lack of desire to let it go. 
our choosing not to think the best, our fighting for our rights and demanding how we're going to be treated to cause these divides. And it literally, and you know what I'm talking about, it spins out of control from a gentle breeze to a full-on F5 tornado, destroying everything in its path. Well, the second thing I believe Satan does is he distracts Christians from our mission and he uses anger to do that because we get so angry at the world around us that we forget that we're not supposed to be angry at the people around us. And we spend our lives being mad at people, dividing groups. lobbing truth bombs over the walls of a church in all capital letters because we're so far removed from the people that Jesus loved because we don't want to get any of them on us that we think the mission is catapulting scripture from miles and miles away hoping that it hits and sticks and they might find Jesus too. Can you imagine how hard it would be to be a non-believer, a person who doesn't know Jesus, to be around an angry Christian and go, I wanna be like that. What I need in my life is a little more anger. You know what I've been missing? I need to be a little more judgmental. I need to be a little more hip hypocritical. I need some more drama in my life. I need to hate some people, you know? And, and in a sense, it's how sometimes we act. Well, they're gonna see Jesus because of how holy we are. No, because it's not holiness. It's 100% distraction. Well, the last thing that happens, and it happens from our anger, and it's, very closely connected to being distracted. And that is that we're being discredited because there is nothing about a person that would discredit you more quickly than being unsafe to be around, unpredictable to have a conversation with, unsafe to let your guard down around, totally discredited a person who only wants to fight and never wants to unite, who's so busy defending every single right we think we have coming to us that we fail to fight for the rights of the people who are around us, that we lobby, we boycott, we yell, we picket, we ignore. And the more we do, the further we move from Jesus and eventually our anger that we would disguise as righteous discredits our witness to the point where we're irrelevant. And we can't give the devil a foothold because his schemes, they work. Why give him an office in our heart to destroy our families, to pull us from our mission and to make us a laughing stock related to our witness. So we go back to the apostle Paul, who's really catching things on ground zero. I mean, all the things Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians could be gateways to this character of anger. They could also be manifestations of this predisposed, uh, predisposed character that we have toward anger. But let's just say that they're gateways and he's trying to catch it early. Quit being so prickly, quit taking every offense before people, not against them. Think the best about the people who are around you. Just be easier to get along with. Give God your anger. Don't be so easily angered. Love is patient. Love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast. It's not proud, it doesn't dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs, which really goes hand in hand with today, but I wanna cover that all next week. It doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. So here's a couple things for you that Joy and I learned from somebody else and we kinda liked and I'm gonna share them with you. 
because it's best to not allow things to, to get started in the first place. And any of us who are in close relationships with somebody else, these are just wise things to apply. First of all, when you are in close relationship with somebody else, don't read ahead. Just pretend that these are all on one line. Never, ever, ever call names. Remember Matthew 5? Those were pretty extreme names. Those were about the most extreme names you could call somebody. But never call names. Never call your spouse a name. Never call your kids a name. Never insult your friends or former friends with a name. Don't call a people group who you disagree with a name. Don't call a politician who leans a different direction than you do a name. Don't call names. Pretty simple. You learn that in kindergarten, by the way. We just don't remember it. But so important. Why? Because names stick. You call your spouse a name. First of all, it makes them angry and you do it because you are angry. But if you do it often enough, it becomes part of who they think they are because you're supposed to be the most important person to them and the way you see them has an effect. When you call your kids a name, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy if you want to call them something, call them who you want them to become. Not something insulting based on what it is that they've done. Number two, never raise your voice. I'm bad at this. And, and I, I'm passionate. That's my excuse. And when you're passionate, you can raise your voice all you want. And when I debate with my wife and my kids, you know, uh, it's not an argument. I mean, my mom and I, we debated when I was in high school and junior high. Everybody around us thought it was Jerry Springer because, I mean, we didn't scream at each other, but I would give a point and it was a good one. And she would give a point. Not quite so good, mom, but it was just a little bit less than my point. And then we would go back and forth and back and forth. And everybody around us would just be exhausted. And I kept that up. Into my marriage, my wife didn't come from a family who debated. Communication was much, much different, her family. I freaked her out, raised my voice, and she's like, what? And finally, she's like, you see when you get passionate and you raise your voice and, you know, people think you're yelling. I'm like, well, I'm not yelling because well, it doesn't really matter, does it, if people think you're yelling? Because the wake you leave in the world, you're responsible for, and we need to be more self-aware, and so don't yell. Now, if you scream at your spouse or scream at your kids or scream at your neighbor, stop. Where does that come from? Anger. What does it cause? Anger. What does it lead to? Destruction or jail time. Just depends. It doesn't lead anywhere, anywhere good. Everyone's going to be offended, but you have to choose whether you're going to live offended. We can relax. Never say never. Isn't that a play on words? Or always. Because you're wrapping a fence around somebody that is impossible to break through, isn't it? You, you're never going to change. What if, if I'm never going to change, then why would I try? You're always like this. Well, if I'm always like this, then what hope is there? You're pronouncing a sentence on somebody. That's not fair, it's not true, it's not the way Jesus sees you or sees them. But yet it's something that we do because it's a strong move in an argument because it's definite. Put your foot down. You're always a jerk. Like, well, always? Like yesterday? Well, not yesterday, but most of the time. I mean, it's never true, but we always do it. This next one's important. And this obviously relates to people who are married. Never threaten divorce. If you have children, never threaten divorce. Um, that's like the nuclear bomb of no-nos. I'm not judging you if you've done it, but I'm just sharing with you. The one thing that a spouse and kids should be able to count on is the fact that the relationship is permanent and that whatever you're going through, you're going through together and you're going to get through it together. As a couple and as a family, and when the idea is introduced that maybe this thing is so big that we're not getting through it together, the fabric of everything else falls apart and leaves almost nowhere to go. Really, really important. 
Okay, this next one is the most important of all. Never, ever, ever quote your pastor when you're having an argument with anyone, especially a spouse. That happened to me just a couple weeks ago. It didn't happen in a bad way, but I was talking to some friends and they're like, yeah, you know, remember when Pastor Rick said, and remember you said that in your sermon. And I'm like, I'm not getting in the middle of this at all. I don't remember what I said. That was last week. I'll have to go to the tape. We'll have to see, you know, I was wanting to duck and cover and get out of there because you never want to use your pastor in an argument. I love both of you and you're both probably right. How about that? Um, The day of your hurt could be the day of your healing. If you take the apostle Paul literally, and scripture seriously. You can allow anger to never gain a foothold in your life. And you can live the way Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. Not quick to anger, not prickly, not combative, not explosive, but gentle, soft-hearted, patient, and kind. Remember, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we have devotions all five days. Monday, tomorrow, you're gonna get a, a push notification or there'll be a QR code behind me. You can access these on any of our social media platforms or on our website. Tomorrow, we're gonna be talking about what's the big deal about anger in the first place? Everybody's angry, so what? On Tuesday, we're gonna talk about righteous anger. You're gonna find out if you have it and probably find out that you think you do, but you don't really have it. You might. On Wednesday, we're gonna talk about anger that we put down deep inside. That's just as dangerous, but it may not explode, but it festers under the surface and comes out in very passive aggressive kind of ways. On Thursday, five different ways. People experience and express anger. You pick the ways you need to work on and we work on them and offer them to the Lord. And on Friday, I'm warning you what's coming. You have probably hurt somebody in your life with your anger. And Friday is a day where you man up, cowboy up, woman up, whatever it is you do and apologize and make it right specifically. And you tell them how you're not gonna do it again. If you can make it to Friday and you can apply this, you can be changed this week and live differently. And you'll be ready to move on to next week when we talk about how love, keeps no record of wrongs. Let's pray. Father, thank you for my friends. I can't wait for this week as we dive into daily exercises, as we work out our faith, the journey we began together in January of this year to be transformed, the blueprint that we have laid out before ourselves each week through the two series that we've been through, through the the daily exercises and devotions, introspection and work that we've done, training ourselves to be different this year than last year, to grow in our faith, to become the people you have in mind, the church you have in mind for your glory and yours alone. God, we're continuing that. We're being as faithful as we can, but we need your help. We need your strength. And we rely on you for that. Today, I... And I trust, along with my friends, offer you this jumbled mess, this knotted mess of anger that exists within our lives. Many are frustrated, many disillusioned, many confused, but we give it to you. You sort it out, bring order to the chaos and show us the path forward beginning with our next step right now and tomorrow and Tuesday and the next. I pray for my friends, Father, and I love them and I'm for them and we're doing this together, but you love them far more than I do and that's what counts. It's because of that that I pray these things with confidence in Jesus' name, amen.